All right, what's going on, boys and girls? So this particular video, we're going to be doing a reaction for some Linux content. This one is top 10 reasons why you should use Linux. I'm always curious to see where these go, see if they're the same tried and true reasons that we always get when, why you should try Linux? Well, let's hope these are some different ones because if it goes down the rabbit hole that I think it does, God help me, ranting will be followed. 10 reasons why you should use Linux rather than Windows or Mac OS. Let's get started. Number 10, Linux is free. And I mean completely free. No licenses, no trials, no hidden fees, nothing. If you want to use Windows without an ugly watermark, you'll have to pay up, costing 120 US dollars for the home edition and 200 US dollars for the pro edition. Linux Linux is not free. You should not treat it as free. If you have a, a way to pay these distro makers, donations, etc., pay them something, be it with your time or financially. These are not free. We should stop using this as a selling point. Privacy respecting, sure. Free, as in the actual cost, no. Some people enjoy doing this stuff in their free time, so they're donating their time. The least we can do is either reciprocate with our own time or money. Because the one thing we can never get back is time. So those are the two most valuable commodities as users we can get. So we really, 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 really fucking need to stop. It's free! As far as the monetary cost, it's the dumbest reason. This is completely free of charge, at least for personal use. Not only that, the source code is free, so anyone with enough technical knowledge can create a whole new distribution of Linux. This is known as being open source compared to Windows and Mac OS's closed source model. There are a few exceptions to this. For example, Zorin OS Ultimate, one of the many distributions or distros of Linux, costs 40 US dollars, but there's a free version that you can use that just removes a few minor customizations. I used it for months and it was fully usable. Elementary OS has a pay what you want scheme where you can choose to pay anywhere from zero to $200 to use it, but no matter what you pay, you get the exact same experience. Number nine, the package manager is a much better way of installing software. On Windows, installing software usually consists of downloading the software from the internet, running an installer, and installing the program that way. On Linux, you have the Package Manager, which allows you to access software in the distribution's repositories. The Package Manager automates this process by allowing you to browse apps through an app store and installing them that way. This is not only easier, but it's also more secure, faster, and safer. If your software isn't in the repository, however, you'll have to go to the developer's website and follow their instructions, which often require the terminal. It might end up being harder than it would on Windows, especially if the developer's instructions aren't well written. However, this isn't horribly common, as most programs for Linux are easy to find in the repositories or an easy download and run. Number okay, so you talk about how windows is go and find your software, you know, go and download the exe, all that stuff. You know, there are a few exceptions, you know, that for what, say what you want about the windows store. Um, the package managers are great. If you know, which package manager you're using, the, this is where package formats come into play and can potentially be a problem. Oh, Hey, look, we only have an RPM. Yes, you can use Alien to convert an RPM to a dev, but on set of issues. Oh, hey, look, you're on Arch. It's not in the repos. Not in the AUR, ironically. Get the building. The point is, package managers are great for keeping the system up to date. They are great for security measures because it updates everything that's on the system. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, programs, core system components, unlike Windows, which is basically just, it updates itself and that's pretty much it. This way at least updates everything. And with certain uh, things like firmware becoming integrated into a lot of like Discover and uh, whatever the GNOME version is, the software stuff, uh, 
it, it's becoming better. And the problem is once you get outside of that, start adding PPAs and Ubuntu based distros. Oh, I got to switch over to the Debian testing. That's not the most ideal experience to actually get your software. And yes, a lot of the times the developers will just say, Hey, here's a bunch of terminal commands. And the first thing most experienced Linux users will tell you is don't just copy and paste stuff from the internet into the terminal. And yet that's exactly what we tell them to do. Great. Linux is inherently more secure than Windows. On Windows, viruses and vulnerabilities are super common, so common that Microsoft bundles an antivirus with Windows 10. On Linux, almost none of the software that you use is coming from outside of the repositories or reputable sources. Also, every time a program needs administrator privileges to run a task, such as installing an application, you have to type the administrator password, not just clicking yes. While this might seem annoying, it's way more secure and it doesn't prompt you unless you are installing removing software, running updates, or changing system files and configurations. Don't be mistaken though, the smaller amount of malware for Linux is mainly because of its 2% market share on desktop. Linux isn't immune to malware and viruses that are just less common and most of them are hard to install for novices because they require a more complicated installation. Number 7. Linux Okay, so let's talk about the, the virus thing. If pe if people really wanted to mess up your a system, they go after the gullible end. That's why. That's why the two percent market market share doesn't mean crap. If you're really gonna do damage to a system, if you're a cracker, as far as a code cracker, then what that boils down to is you're gonna look for code flaws in Linux. Because that means most of the back end of the internet, that's pretty much what it is. So if you're, but a lot of these are going to be script kitties and phishing schemes and all this other stuff. That market is the gullible end of the market. So it's easier to go for this because it's full of dumb. Sorry, generic end users. Or you can try and be malicious and go after like companies and the other stuff, which is mostly Linux based. If you're looking for damage, you're going to go for the internet based ones. If you're looking for quick cash, you're going to go for the gullible. That's just what it is. As far as being more or less secure, it depends on how you want to look at it. Windows is a lot more secure than it used to be. You know, Windows set. 95 to 7 all the way through um but really it's just a design portion windows is a single user system trying to be multi-user linux is a multi-user system that can go down to a single user it's you're not trying to build from one then put two on then three then four you're going from a base of a lot up to one you're not building a reverse pyramid you're building a pyramid and the pyramid at the top is, is you where it stops. Windows flips that around and goes from the bottom, goes up. And that's where that problem starts. Linux has better out-of-the-box hardware support, generally. When you plug in a new piece of hardware, either internal or external, into your computer, you're probably used to installing drivers either from a website or through a provided CD. On Linux, most drivers are either in the repository or included right with the system. For example, many Wi-Fi drivers are bundled directly in Linux but weren't bundled in Windows for years. Pop OS even has an NVIDIA-specific installer, allowing you to install in computers with NVIDIA graphics cards without installing any drivers after the fact. Yeah, the exception is when the hardware sure. doesn't work out of the box. If the hardware doesn't work out of the box, then you'll often be stuck with clunky, out-of-date, hard-to-install drivers, so definitely look up hardware compatibility before installing Linux. Number six, the terminal um, is actually not that scary. It is totally possible to use a Linux system without ever touching the terminal. However, once you get the hang of it, it's really useful. You can do everything that you do in a graphical interface using the terminal, and it's much faster a lot of the time. It's also totally fine to copy and paste code, as long as you're copying and pasting from a reputable source. And no, leaving off a letter in a copy and paste will most likely not break your computer, and your terminal will just likely return an error. Number five, Linux is far more. Here's the problem with the, uh, relying solely on the terminal. 
We talk about wanting to grow the audience so that more people come in, the fresh blood and the fresh perspectives and all that stuff. Yet we rely on the terminal as the killer feature. And ironically, the people that market a terminal the best is not Linux, but Microsoft. The terminal is great and users, generic end users don't want to fucking see it. I'm talking everyday mom and pop users. They don't care. They, uh, and ironic, I still find it ironic that we sit there and tell people, oh, don't copy and paste code from, from the web. And yet that's exactly what we do every time we go to a mint, you know, like a Linux mint forum, uh, the arch wiki, take your pick. And we're essentially doing everything we tell people not to. So the irony is is real. Um, I love the terminal, but also I don't rely on it. I try to do as much as I can through the GUI because that's the one that most people are going to use that are not of the tech enthusiast crowd when it comes to Linux. And that's okay. I think being versed in both helps. Customizable in Windows. Whether you want Linux to look like Windows, Mac OS, or something completely unique, you can do it. There are the normal customizations, such as changing the position of the taskbar and changing the background, but you can move further than that. You can change the font to Comic Sans for all the operating system cares, although that's probably not a very good idea. Number four, Linux doesn't have annoying updates. Yes, custom, uh, customization is a thing. Sort of. Because here's the caveat. It depends on your distro and the desktop environment. Most people aren't going to go out of their way to really customize like vanilla GNOME if that's what they're using. They, they just want to use the system and that's what they want to do. And that's fine. If you're talking plasma user, if you're talking, you know, some of some of those that end of things, yeah, we love customization. I'm a plasma guy. I have a uh, gnome, gnome machine, but I have to use about 20 extensions to make it usable for me. Now, again, that's me. Plasma, all the crap that I need that for plasma to be usable for me is literally built into the system. That's the difference. Now, that, that's not getting into things like enlightenment, flux, flux, you know, take your pick. It really boils down to what you're looking for in a system. Um, if I'm just giving a system to a general end user, I'll probably stick them on GNOME because it's literally everything's there. It's like, there's no, uh, too many options in your face. Like plasma has the propensity to do sometimes and no generically dumb defaults. On windows updates often involve forced restarts, sometimes even while you're working and are extremely common due to the amount of security patches that have to be done. On Linux, updates are easy, quick, and not nearly as intrusive. You can also choose to do them whatever you want to. Number three, Linux is more stable. You are correct. Um, updates are not so much a thing on Linux. Basically, kernel updates, NVIDIA driver updates, those are about the only times you have to reboot a system. But generically, you can still keep running the system until you decide to reboot it. So it's perfectly fine. Uh, Windows has gotten better-ish, kind of. Um, you know, with like timed updates when you can, like, you're, when you're available, you know, if you want to do your updates overnight, it leaves you alone. That's when it does its updates, that kind of deal. It's gotten better than it used to be, where it was just like when Windows 10 first rolled out, it was obnoxious. Now... It's a bit better, still not as free flowing as say Linux is, you know, you can, you can leave the system running for years without running any of those updates for the, uh, that you've already installed for the reboot, but that's your prerogative. Windows is going to be like, yeah, nope, sorry, time to go. Well, in Windows, there's a reason that most web servers are built on top of Linux. Linux is extremely stable and can run for years without ever crashing or needing a reboot. Try to do the same on Windows and you'll most likely get a crash. Number two, the Linux community is generally very helpful. If you run into an issue with Linux, you can generally ask on the forums and people will provide helpful answers. 
at least for the most part. Good places. <laughs> for the most part. The problem is, is depending where you land, where you search. So for propensity and recommendations, I'm going to say Destination Linux. I'm going to say Linux for everyone. I'm also going to plug Big Daddy Linux. Uh, I'm going to plug, you know, some of those communities and the Telegram channels there. That's where I would look for help personally, because they are users of all levels from distro makers to everyday end users. And those are the people that and that wide range is the type that you want to get help from. Just to ask are the official forums for your distribution of choice and the Linux for noobs community on Reddit. Number one. You so as far as uh, r slash Linux or well, anything Linux related on Reddit. Uh, I'm just going to be blunt fucking dumpster fire just my take you can run it right off a usb stick or even through the internet you don't need to wipe or even touch the hard drive to try out linux you can run it straight from a usb stick or even through the internet using a site called distro test mm -hmm. using either of these methods you can install software open files change settings and do anything you would do with linux with one exception files that you save and changes that you make will be deleted on next reboot a quick thing to note about DistroTest though, it is extremely slow compared to installing it on the computer directly due to it being streamed over the internet, so don't judge Linux's speed from the site. Anyways, thanks for watching. If this was helpful... As far as the live USB stuff, yes, it is a lifesaver, and you can actually have a persistent mode on some distros. I know eLive has one, I know there's a way to do one on Ubuntu distros. And so that way, when you pull out the USB, it's saved. And that's that. That's the system. So other than a, probably, probably about half of these are the typical, oh, it's free. Oh, it's secure. Oh, it's the other ones. They're different-ish, kind of. It's just a lot of the same stuff that we always see. And the problem I have with these kind of lists is it doesn't, take into account one thing like the biggest selling point for any Linux machine control it's yours you determine everything you determine if you want to stay on 2004 even past the the, the support date you determine what apps can get yanked and what cannot you determine what gets installed that's you determine how what kernel you want to run you want a zen kernel or do you want the the mainline kernel do you want take your pick at the end of the day it boils down to one big selling feature control you control how much data you give how much data you don't give you are in control of in your system and that is the selling point we need to be pushing because you can talk privacy and security and all the other stuff at the end of the day people want to feel like they own stuff so make them feel like they own the experience of their computer it's that simple you don't need 10 reasons and the same Try and true, oh, it's free, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. Just sell it for what it is. It's control of the system, and the user is the one that defines that control. How much or how little they want to have.